So it's finally happened. Arsenal fans have begun to officially irritate me. And not all of you, just a few in my comment section. Now, here's what happened. I put out a video of a reaction to the Fat Asians' Clueless Americans Guide to the Champions League. In that video, Arsenal copyright claimed a section of the video, about a minute chunk of the video, with footage of Arsenal matches. They copyright claimed that material. Fair play. I'm not going to win a copyright dispute with Arsenal and a Premier League club, so I decided to use YouTube's auto uh, edit tool, cut out that section of the video. Well, I am a Spurs fan, okay? That's unfortunate that it had to be Arsenal that got copyright claimed. And so immediate character assassination takes place in my comments. Immediately, they say it's a weak move. They say that they used to have used to have respect for for my channel, but because I did that, all of a sudden, you know, it's a weak and cowardly move. I tell them I only removed it because of copyright claim, and they question my motives again, saying, "Oh, well, it's only Arsenal that gets copyright claimed." Yeah. It was only Arsenal who claimed copyright, but I did end up removing a little section of Barca because two days later, Barca claimed a part of the video. So, no, it's not just that it's Arsenal. It's the fact that it got copyright claimed. So, because of that, this channel has always existed in a, a sort of ethos of appreciation. I've never, ever tried to make a channel so sectarian that it's just about my club and my rivalries. So, with that being said... I'm going to do something that's unheard of from a Spurs fan. I'm going to do this little stream, and I am going to give Arsenal their flowers for an hour. Do not test my politeness. Arsenal FC have been around a long time. How long? This long. And after 137 years, Arsenal have become one of the most recognisable clubs in world football, while also being one of the most successful clubs domestically in England. But what is the entire history of Arsenal, I hear you ask? So the club was founded in 1886 and was actually named Dull Square Football Club and it was led by a group of workers employed by the Dull Square Workshop at the Royal Arsenal, which was an arms factory in Woolwich, South East London, which at the time... Ah, uh, is that why we're called the Gunners? I'm, ass I'm assuming that that's why they're called the Gunners. It's actually in Kent, but was incorporated into London in 1889. And the club was founded by a man called David Danskin. Now, David was actually a Scottish mechanical engineer, and he actually loved football in his spare time. And he moved to London in 1885 to find work, and took a job at Dull Square Workshop at the Royal Arsenal in Woolwich in the end. And Danskin, alongside Jack Humble, Fred Beardsley and Morris Bates, together created Dull Square FC. Now, Fred Beardsley and Morris Bates were actually former Nottingham Forest players, Players, and Fred Beardsley was their goalkeeper so he had tamed a set of red kits from his old club for them to use in their first ever game sporting the Arsenal red kit colour and with a group of the workers from the factory Dull Square played their first match on the 11th of December 1886 against Eastern Wanderers on an open field on the Isles of Dogs which they I have a question and you can let me know down in the comment section why are so many teams called Wanderers you got the Bolton Wanderers don't you I, I've, I've witnessed other teams called Wanderers can y'all let me know why that's such a popular club name or nickname? 1-6-0. Now the club was renamed to Royal Arsenal soon afterwards, reportedly being on Christmas Day, so they only ever really played one game was the Dull Square FC team. Now at this time, Royal Arsenal was still an amateur side, so they really struggled to find places to play. At the start, they played at Plumstead Common in South East London, but soon sought after alternative homes. And they really struggled to consistently stay in the same place. They landed in Fortsman Ground, then they landed in Manor Ground in 1888, then moved to Invicta Ground in 1890, but then could not afford the rent, so had to move back to Manor Ground three years later. However, despite the ground movements, Royal Arsenal were actually very successful in this time with various local trophies. They won both Kent Senior Cup and the London Charity Cup in 1890 and the London Senior Cup in 1891. But problems started to happen for Royal Arsenal. They entered the FA Cup for the first time in 1889 to 1890. But Arsenal was still an amateur side, so the golf and class between the professional sides in a tournament that had been going on for 20 years at this point was clear apparent. And when they played professional sides, they could see the players at their are playing against and try and poach them for easy contracts. Now at this point most of the professional sides in the UK were at the north side of the country and when Arsenal didn't even play them before it weren't really an issue but when they started playing in the Cubs it became an issue as they played bigger sides. Derby County they played them in the FA Cup in 1891. Arsenal got destroyed but they also had two of their players stolen by Derby County trying to get them on professional contracts. Now Royal Arsenal were not happy with this so they actually moved to professionalism in 1891 but this was frowned upon by many of the amateur southern clubs and they were banned from participating. 
Yeah, this is something that I learned a little while back. I wasn't um, I wasn't so familiar with it. There's a there's a Netflix show series called The English Game, uh, and it's it's more of a like melodramatic, um, romanticized version. It's not really uh, very accurate to the to the real history. But one thing that they brought up constantly in that uh, series was the uh, disdain and many football fans for professionalism in sports. Uh, they thought that it uh, ruined the purity of the game. And so uh, it should be more of a, but, but see what ends up happening that is if, if you remove professionalism from the game and you just keep it a game that's for, you know, uh, gentlemen, um, it's always going to end up being a game that's hard for the lower classes to be a part of because they don't have the requisite time to train because they have to go work. They have to go put hours in uh, to, to pay the bills. But the, the rich uh, gentlemen could afford to take time and, and train and play and, and spend their time doing that because they didn't have to work the, you know, the, the shift work that a lot of the uh, lower class players had to do. And so you had clubs that were in the, you know, FA cup that couldn't compete because they, they couldn't, I mean, players would come straight from work to play a game. They didn't have time to train with a team or, or discuss tactics or anything like that. That's the kind of argument that was made in that series. I'm not sure that that's entirely historically correct, but it made a lot of sense. And so uh, I just went on a long rant in the middle of a, an Arsenal Flowers video, but let's get into it in local competitions by the London Football Association. This meant they could only play FA Cup games and friendly, so obviously this not being very good for the long-term players of the team. Royal Arsenal tried to set up a football league to rival the Northern League in the South, but it just didn't work. But after a couple more years, more teams were kept coming professional, and Arsenal actually changed the name to Woolwich Arsenal in 1893, when it formed as a limited liability company. And the club was also invited to join the Football League, initially in the second division, becoming the first Southern club to enter the league. Now at this point, Arsenal were a proper company trying to make money from football and trying to be a big established side. Now a lot of the people in the club, amateur players, did not like this and they wanted to just be a bit of a fun game and still do their work in the factories. And they broke away and made their own workers team away from Royal Arsenal called Royal Ordnance Factories. Now this team only lasted three years in the end. But Woolwich Arsenal broke away and played in the second division for 11 seasons and generally occupied mid-table positions before the appointment of Harry Bradshaw as manager in 1899. Now Harry Bradshaw had actually been a manager for four years before this for Burnley, his local side, and actually did quite well getting them promoted and coming third in the first division. Back then, this was very important because he knew big players around the country, and when he came into Arsenal, he brought in Jimmy Ashcroft, who was England's first ever international in goal, and captain Jimmy Jackson. Now, these two were brilliant signings, and they end up playing over 400 games for Arsenal combined. Now, Harry Bradshaw stayed at Woolwich Arsenal for five years and actually got them promoted in the 1903-1904 season to the first division being the first Southern club to be in the main top flight. But before Arsenal had even kicked the ball in the top flight, he decided to leave to London rivals Fulham, who still played in the Southern League because they offered him a lot of money. And the struggles were mostly down to the fact that they had really bad financial problems. Now, football had taken a massive boom in the early 20th century, so a lot of people cared about it and the professional league was growing every year. However, Arsenal were one of the only Southern teams in it. And they were also in a relatively unpopulated area of Plumstead, which at the time was in the urban and outskirts of London. It's meant that attendances were low and they struggled to make much income. And to stay afloat, Woolwich Arsenal had to sell most of their best players, Ashcroft being the goalkeeper and Tim Coleman and Burt Freeman being two amazing attackers being having to get sold for a lot of money at the time. This meant they slowly started to slip down the table, which compounded their financial situation as crowds fell even more because they weren't playing higher quality football. By the end of the decade, the average attendance of Manic- Wow. Is that one of the earliest, uh, I guess, that, that little graphic shows one of the earliest matches between our two clubs, um, Arsenal versus Spurs, which I know is a heated, contested, historic rivalry. And as I said at the, the front of this video, unless I edited it out, um, I I am a Spurs fan. Uh, I, have, I have grown to really appreciate them. And I know that that is a head scratcher for many people, uh, but... Uh, I, I don't know the the history of the rivalry as deep, um, and I don't have the the emotional uh, uh, 
a rivalry as deep as maybe it should. So uh, I guess in this video, I'm both giving Arsenal their flowers by also appreciating their history. Um, I'm always going to be trying to be neutral here, but I do know that when it comes time for us to be on the pitch, uh, I'm never, ever wanting Arsenal to succeed. In your ugly yellow kits. The red kits are fire. The yellow kits, awful was 11,000, a little over half of what it had been in 1904. The club was close to bankruptcy and in 1910 went into voluntary liquidation before being bought out by a consortium of businessmen, which was led by Sir Henry Norris, who was also the chairman of Fulham FC at the time. And now this is where it gets kind of interesting because Norris knew about the Woolwich Arsenal's location problems and the money problems that they had when he bought it. And he actually tried to merge Fulham with Arsenal as he bought them, which is kind of crazy if you think about it now. The Football League blocked this, however, so his next plan was to abandon the merger and look for it to move the club somewhere else, getting outside of South East London. And eventually he picked a site in Highbury, North London, where he wanted to move the team. Now obviously this became a very iconic place and very much what Arsenal are nowadays and their identity is very much inside North London. But being a club from Woolwich, it did obviously have a lot of objections. Residents of Highbury were annoyed about it and residents of Woolwich were annoyed that their team was leaving. However, Norris wanted to put it in a more concentrated area of people more there so he did it anyway spending 125 grand which nowadays is the equivalent of 13 million pounds on building wow. the new stadium and three years after he took over the club in 1913 Arsenal finally moved to Highbury in North London. Now despite having a fancy new stadium and a new location Woolwich Arsenal actually got relegated from the first division and only got three wins in 38 games coming bottom so they moved into the second division on their first season wow. with the new stadium and of course Woolwich Arsenal obviously needed to be changed as they they were no longer in Woolwich and they simply were in North London so they were changed to the Arsenal in 1914. Right. Now it was a slow rebuild needed for the Arsenal at the time and when they moved to Highbury it brought in new ground was 23,000 people compared to the 11,000 at Manor Ground this gave them a lot more financial income as a lot more people decided to become fans and see them a lot more. Right. However obviously if you know what happened in the early 1910s in the UK then you can understand they didn't play many games. Now football no, returned from the First World War okay. in 1990 and Arsenal came sixth in 1914-1915 which obviously the first season before that in the second division but they controversially rejoined the first division in 1919 anyway this was because the football league was actually moving from 20 teams to 22 teams in the first division now this is where the big controversy really is Chelsea and Tottenham Hotspur got relegated from the first Next. division that season so usually you would just think that they would probably just stay in the division Chelsea were agreed to stay in the division and were given a special place in that first division again but instead of it going to Tottenham Hotspur it actually went to an AGM vote in a meeting this was down to a lot of different teams Tottenham, Barnsley, Wolves, Birmingham, Arsenal, Hull and Nottingham Forest were all given the chance to be in there a bit weird because teams like Nottingham Forest came 18th in that season as well and at the meeting the league actually voted right, to I'm gonna read this little I'm gonna read this plaque real quick because uh, I'm a little confused at what's going on here Extension of the Football League, important meeting today. Uh, the special general meeting of the Football League was held in Manchester today, principally for considering the question of the future constitution of the league and whether each division should remain at 20 clubs or be extended by two clubs. Okay. There were nine applications for the two vacant places in the first league. In the event of a decision being reached to make each division 22 clubs, the choice of the two additional clubs will be made from Chelsea, Tottenham, Arsenal, Birmingham, Birmingham, Wolverhampton Wanderers. Ah, oh, that's before they were Wolves. Okay. Uh, Nottingham Forest, Barnsley, Stockport, Stockport County, and Hull City, who are the applicants. In the event of a like decision being arrived at in the second division, the applicants are Coventry City, Rotherham County, Port. Uh, I can't read that because it's the old type. Uh, Southport, Vul Vulcan. Rochdale, South Shields, and West Ham. All right, so I recognize a lot of these uh, club names, and, and a lot of these are not even in the Premier League. They're in uh, lower divisions, but I recognize a lot of these uh, these teams. Okay, so the extension of the Football League, we're going to add two clubs to each league, and I guess uh, Tottenham were, were not given that, that opportunity. 
Arsenal for reasons of history over merit because Arsenal were the long-serving football league team that were from the south over any of the other teams and they landslided all of them with 18 votes. Now this was very suspicious because Arsenal used the fact that they were long-serving to league football but teams like Wolverhampton Wanderers had been in the football league a lot longer than them and actually finished two points above them in the season so they would appear to have a stronger claim you would think but it has been alleged that this was due to the backroom deals or even outright bribery from the Arsenal owner of Sir Henry Norris, colliding with his friend John McKenna, the chairman of Liverpool and the Football League, who recommended Arsenal's promotion at the AGM. Now, no conclusive proof of wrongdoing has ever come to light, but Norris's financial dealings unrelated to this are a bit suspicious, and he was actually fired in 1929, being found guilty from the Football Association of financial irregularities, and being found out to misuse his expenses account. Now, there may be other reasons why Arsenal got in as well, because in the book Making the Arsenal, it proposed is a different reason for the election, looking at the fact that there was a lot of teams match fixing just before the war, and Liverpool and Manchester United were some of these teams that Norris knew about. And Norris said if they weren't relegated or had complete expulsion from the league, he threatened to organise a breakaway from the league by Midlands and Southern clubs if nothing was done. And they felt that this was a proper solidified way of getting teams out of there, so they had to promote Arsenal to the first division, basically being blackmailed. But no matter how Arsenal got into the first division, they did, and they have stayed there ever since being the longest really? record of any team staying wow. in the top flight being all right i mean i gotta give it up for the fact that they stayed in the top division this long that's worthy of some flowers i mean uh, what else am i supposed to say they've stayed in the top division since that time that's crazy that's that's impressive of 104 years now. But back in 1919, years. the club's wow. return to the first division was not immediately successful. Under Leslie Knighton, the club never finished higher than ninth, and in the 1923-1924 season, came close to returning to the second division and finishing 19, only one point above the relegation zone. And after another poor season in 1925, Norris, the Arsenal owner, decided to finally get rid of Knighton and decided to appoint Huddersfield Town manager Herbert Chapman at the time. Now that name might be quite common to you because Herbert Chapman is one of the reasons why Arsenal what it is today and one of the most influential managers in English football and definitely for Arsenal and that is proven because he is in the select few who have a statue outside the Emirates of him today. Now Herbert Chapman came in and knew what he was doing he had played the game professionally at the time and he'd also managed for 20 years before this at various clubs so he knew he was definitely at the top of the game. He came in and he changed the whole picture for Arsenal. He reformed many of the club's practices including modernising the training and physiotherapy regimes. He also also did changes like adding numbers to the players shirts in 1928 and also changing the team's colours to adding white sleeves to the red in 1933. Chapman also insisted on journalists using Arsenal not the Arsenal even though the team had changed the name 20 years ago and he actually campaigned to get the local tube station to be called Arsenal from then and obviously to this day it's still called that. Now when Chapman joined the club he actually had a lot of money to spend. Henry Norris actually gave him a lot of money which was the first time ever because he was usually quite reluctant to spend money on actual players and not bribe yourself into the league. And this actually led to Arsenal becoming the money bags team of the 19th century. They led to them being called the Bank of England Club, like some clubs you could say now. And Chapman's first signing was veteran Charlie Buckham from Sunderland. Now, Charlie yeah. Buckham was actually a very influential player for this team. He had scored over 200 league goals for Sunderland in the last few years and was a massive player in the country. Wow, wait a second. This is his, his personal career. Man, he played for from 1911 to 1928. That's a a long career. That's 17 years of wow, amazing. Amazing. Century. But more importantly, when Arsenal were beaten 7 0 by Newcastle in October 1925, Buckham suggested a change to the formation to adapt to a relaxation of the offside rule. This led to Arsenal changing the formation to something called the WM. This strengthened the defence by pushing the centre half back into the defence and the fullbacks out on the wings. And Chapman developed this formation over time, putting emphasis on the pacey forward line, wingers cutting inside, and the role of creative ball player midfielders. In his first season, Chapman completely overperformed, and they actually finished second in the league which was a crazy jump from where they came from the season before however the next few seasons didn't go as well and Chapman's team came mid-table for quite a few years but he did not worry and he wanted to get his new players familiar with his new formation and new ideas that he was bringing to football so players like Joe Holm, Jack Lambert, Tom Parker, Herbie Roberts all tried to get into that new formation it took a few years to get there and despite existing for 30 years at this point Arsenal had only professionally won the second division but they did reach the FA Cup final for the first time in 
in 1927, but to lose 1-0 to Cardiff City, unfortunately. This was down to goalkeeper Dan Lewis making a massive mistake, letting a ball slip between his hands and go into the net to lose 1-0. And this is still the only time a team outside of England have won the FA Cup. However, Chapman mm. did not get deterred by this and continued to build his side, signing future captain Eddie Hapgood, as well as three of the club's great attacking players, David Jack, Alex James and Cliff Baston. And with these players, Arsenal started to get better every single year. And in 1929 to 1930, Arsenal reached the FA Cup final again against Chapman's wow. old club Huddersfield Town. This match actually had an enormous German airship called the Graf Zeppelin above it in the match. And with a 92,000 strong crowd, Arsenal were not distracted Whoa. from their task and won 2-0 with goals from James. Let's not just gloss gloss over a 92,000 attendance. That's that's a heavily attended match. Um, man, lots of large stadiums barely even fit a capacity of 92,000. So that's that's amazing and Lambert to bring home the club's first major trophy. This FA Cup success was the first in a decade in which Arsenal were the dominant club in England. They won their first division for the first time in 1931, just beating Aston Villa to the title. In 1932, they actually lost the FA Cup final and got pipped in second in the league to Everton, but they were still showing they were a very strong side in England. And bounced back in 1933, winning their second league title. Beating Aston Villa 5-0 at Highbury in April to clinch the title. And by this point, Arsenal were a very feared team in England. However, they mm. did lose in the FA Cup that year to third division Northside in a major upset to Walsall 2 0. Arsenal had five players out with flu in the game and actually had to play a lot of backups in it. One of them was Tommy Black, who was really bad at conceding the penalty. Herbert Chapman, being a typical hothead, just got rid of him after a week to play with our goal because he was so pissed off with the result. And he transferred a lot of the players from that game straight away after. Now, unfortunately, this was not the only bad. It sounds, it sounds like like Chapman had that kind of personality that that is impulsive uh that really impulsive like just making decisions based on uh, emotional emotional reasoning not to say not to, I'm not trying to give too much criticism here but just that the fact that he's he does impulsive things like that um, in response to not getting his way thing that happened to Arsenal around this time. In 1934, they actually started the season quite well with Herbert Chapman in charge. But on the 6th of January 1934, Herbert Chapman unfortunately died from pneumonia. This came out of nowhere and he'd only just picking up symptoms a few days before. And Arsenal had wow. really got to the top of English football because of his management and suddenly he was gone. So it was a big loss for the team. And his legacy has definitely lived on in Arsenal for all these years later. Now, with it being hard to find a manager at the time, you don't really have the marquee you do now. They basically just appointed Joe Joe Shaw, a former player who was their reserve manager at the time. Now, despite this, Arsenal still went on to win the 1934 First Division title, but did score 75 goals, which was a lot less compared to the 118 the year before. And Joe Shaw, it was the only time he ever wow. managed a professional club in his whole life, and it ended up getting him a First Division trophy in just six months. But despite this, Arsenal still decided to get rid of him in the summer of 1934, and appointed George Allison, who was only a director of the club and never managed a team before, to be the new manager for the team. In his first few years, George Allison really did the same things as Herbert Chapman. He signed the players that Herbert Chapman had identified in the summer, being Ted Drake, Jack Creston and Wilf Coppin, and also did the same tactics that he did. And he helped Arsenal win their third league title in the row in 1935. And Arsenal were brilliant this season. They were back to their attack and best, with new signing Ted Drake scoring 42 league goals, which is a club record. And Arsenal were definitely the best team in England. They had so much strength that seven of the players that played for England against world champions Italy in 1934 were on Arsenal's books. Arsenal's ongoing mm. success did attract larger crowds and more people became a fan of the Arsenal. Highbury was completely redeveloped with new stands and a completely new way of looking at it, with the North mm. Bank and Clock End stands getting roofs installed. And the team did continue to have success. They won their second FA Cup in 1936, winning 1-0 against Sheffield United in the final and won their fifth league title in 1938, mm. pipping Wolves on the final day to cap off a highly successful decade, winning five football leagues and two FA Cups. Arsenal could not follow this up in the immediate future, however, because the Second World War was started in 1939 and all first-class football in Britain was suspended. Before we get into the World War II era, uh, I do find it fascinating watching this historical um, data unfold. I do find it interesting seeing a lot of clubs that I recognize, but I have my modern 
frame of reference because I look at the like clubs like Wolves or, or Wolverhampton uh, now, and I compare it to then, and are you see clubs that are are doing well like Everton at the top of the league, and like that's just not what they are right now. And so uh, it's interesting to see the the history of the sport and clubs that are really struggling right now having you know an era of dominance in the early days. It's interesting. It's really interesting. Highbury was actually used as an air raid precaution station with a barrage balloon operating behind the clock end. During the blitz, a bomb fell on the north bank, destroying the roof and setting fire Ooh. to the scrap that was being stored on the terrace. However, Highbury did survive and Arsenal actually mm. played most of their games at White Hart Lane in this time. This is because some players of the teams did not go to the war and still played football, but these do not count as official statistics and competitions were played on a regional basis rather than a league basis for the whole country. There was little War Cup and London title titles that still happened and Arsenal did win a few cups in the war. With there not being a lot of football going around, in November 1945 the league competition still suspended, Arsenal were one of the teams that actually played Dynamo Moscow side touring in the UK. With many players still serving abroad in the armed forces, Arsenal was severely depleted and used six guest players including Stanley Matthews and Stan Mortson who were England international. The match was played at White Hart Lane in thick fog and Dynamo won 4-3 over Arsenal. The score is genuinely agreed upon but there's accounts on who scored and what time the game was on and how many people actually played in it, with English reports saying that Dynamo fielded 12 players at one point. The match actually inspired George Orwell to write the 1945 essay The Sport and Spirit where he basically talked about it was a war with no shooting because there was a lot of bad tackles and a lot of aggression. With Germany surrendering, the war at final. This is this is the time that I'm I'm going to show my historical nerdness. I want to read that Orwell article so bad. In fact, maybe I'll do a maybe I'll do another video about the Orwell article or, or reading other football historical documents. That I I nerd out about this kind of stuff. I love history. I love the history of, of sporting, especially, um, and even this. Like, you know, I know that I'm a I'm a Spurs fan, but I mean, learning the history of Arsenal is enlightening. It's good to know this history. Finally ended in 1945, but they decided not to start football until the 1946 summer because they wanted players to have a time off. Unfortunately, Arsenal lost nine players to the war, the most out of any top flight club, and the interim time had cut short the careers of several others, including Bastin and Drake, which were their best players. Additionally, the construction of Highbury was basically screwed as the roof got blown apart and they needed a lot of financial burden still on the club. This meant Arsenal struggled when competitive football started again in 1946. The club finished 13th in the league, which was their worst in 17 years, and lost in the third round of the FA Cup. With the team not where it is, manager George Allison decided to retire from football at the end of the season, and he was replaced by his assistant Tom Whitaker, a long-time servant of the club and a trainer under Chapman. Whitaker had developed a lot of Herbert Chapman's tactics and learned a lot from him, and actually won the league title straight away in 1947-1948 season, led by captain Joe Mercer, strong defence, and with goals from the attacking front two of Reg Lewis and Ronnie route but with these players all being over 30 now Arsenal really needed to rebuild so they brought in a lot of new players like Doug Lishman, Alex Forbes and Cliff Holton. Although Arsenal were unable to sustain any real challenges for the league title after that for the next few years and actually did win the FA Cup two years later in 1950 with Reg Lewis still being there scoring twice in the final against Liverpool. And after this Arsenal got pretty unlucky. In the next few years they lost the league title and the FA Cups by getting injuries in the finals for the next couple of years and really did struggle to to get that top even though they had a lot of good players when they were all fit. But they were still a massive team and in 1953 they still won their 7th league title and one of the closest title races of all time, beating Preston North End to the title on goal average after finishing level 1 points. Yeah, they did it on goal average back in the day. However, after 1953, Arsenal really struggled to be a big club. They did not win anything for 17 years. And just three years after their league title, Whitaker unfortunately unexpectedly died as well, their manager at the time. And with Arsenal not being a place where people wanted to go, they found themselves unable to attract many stars. And they also ended up selling a lot of their big young stars that were coming through. This was a dark period for the team. Managers Jack Creaston and George Swindon just couldn't get the team to any good levels. And they only really finished above mid-table a few times and failed to go past the FA Cup quarter-final for like 15 years. The team looked like they did before Herbert Chapman had joined and it seemed like all renovations to him had completely... You see that, you see that boy pop, puffing on a pipe in the stands? I love that... Uh, I would grab my pipe, but I love that um, 
the atmosphere, the footballing gentleman sport. I love it. I love it so much. I, there's nothing more that I'd like to do than to stand in the stands watching a football match, wearing a suit and tie, and puffing on a, a, a pipe. <laughs> That's awesome. Gone, and it seemed like the team were never going to get back up as they were fully a mid table team for two decades. And it really wasn't good for Arsenal. In 1962, they made the bold but pretty bad decision to hire former England and Wolves captain Billy Wright as manager, despite his lack of management experience and the fact that he had no prior experience with the club either. Now, Billy Wright was not a very good manager, but he did lead the club to their first debut in European competition in the 1964 Inter Cities Fairs Cup because they finished seventh the season before. And Billy Wright was seen as someone who was quite childish to criticism and couldn't take it. In his final season at Arsenal in 1966, Arsenal finished 14th, their lowest position in 36 years, and recorded the lowest attendance at Highbury at 4,500 for a match against Leeds. And this match took place just a Whoa, few months. 4,500 in that, in that arena, in that stadium. That must have been very sparse attendance. Uh, wow before the 1966 World Cup final where it had record attendances in England. And Arsenal, once a team that had seven English players in the team, only had one in their World Cup winning side, being George Easton, who didn't even play at all during the tournament. Now, at this point, the ownership of Arsenal had moved around a lot. It weren't really considered as a very good thing to own the club. It was sort of more seen to be good for the working class people and help them with different communities rather than actually being a good asset for money. Now, former cricketer Samuel Hill Wood actually took over the club after Henry Norris was disgraced out of it in 1929. Now Samuel Hill Wood was in charge twice and he actually ended up dying in 1949 so he gave up ownership. This meant that the other house that had a lot of ownership in Arsenal, the Smith family, decided to take over and Bracewell Smith was actually the chairman for 1949 to 1962. But Bracewell Smith decided to not be the chairman that long. He was in 1962, he decided to give up the chairmanship of Arsenal and it actually went back to the other family with Dennis Hill Wood being the son of obviously Samuel Hill would taken over. Now Dennis also played cricket to a very high level for Derbyshire like his dad but his football knowledge weren't really seen to be that good. In 1962 he hired Billy Wright as manager and obviously that did not go well. He weren't a very good manager, hadn't managed before and weren't good enough. But with Arsenal falling down the table it's very interesting to see who he's going to pick up in 1966 and he surprised everyone by probably picking the most weirdest choice to be manager ever. He picked Bertie Mee to be the new Arsenal football club manager. Now Bertie Mee did play professional football but barely he only played 13 registered games at the top level he also was yeah. the physiotherapist for arsenal at the time and there was reports that him himself was surprised he got the job as in his contract he had a 12 month clause that if he was unsuccessful he could go back to being the physiotherapist for the club and me knew that he had a lot of tactical shortcomings so he hired dave sexton and don howe as his assistants as soon as he joined to help him with the tactics these were two people that had played at the top level of football and were trying to get into the managing game and they both ended up having quite successful managing careers. And this brought me a professional approach to the club and promoted talent from within. Arsenal's youth team had won the FA Youth Cup in 1966 and talented attacking players such as Charlie George, John Radford, Peter Simpson and Ray Kennedy all were graduated the first team straight away. Most of the players that he called up were attacking players so to counterbalance this he wanted to have defensive players that had a lot of experience. So he had Frank McClintoff who was the captain who was a centre half and he marshalled the strong defence while hard tackle and Peter Storey filled the defensive midfield position. Now this team wasn't excellent but they did show promise getting to two League Cup finals in 1968 and 1969 but they did lose both of them. Despite getting to these finals the second League Cup loss final was really poor. Arsenal lost 3-1 to third division side Swindon Town being one of the biggest final upsets of all time. However Arsenal did have eight players out with flu and they basically didn't have a team in the finals so I guess it's a bit more understandable and they did have a decent team because that season they actually finished fourth which is a place in Europe in 1970 and this led to the club collecting their first silverware in 17 years and also their first European trophy in the 1969-1970 Intercities Fairs Cup beating Ajax 3-1 on aggregate in the semi-final and Angela in the final. Now it's a good thing to say the Intercities Cup was basically like the Europa League of its time and the final was definitely iconic. Arsenal were 3-0 down after 74 minutes in the first leg but Ray Kennedy got a late away goal to give Arsenal a glimmer of hope. In the second leg in front of a packed 
Tybury, inspired by Captain Frank McIntyre, Arsenal won 3 0 with goals from John Radcliffe, Eddie Kelly, and John Samuels to win the tie 4 3 on aggregate. However, in that 1969 1970 season, they really didn't do very well in the league, came in 12, probably distracted by the European campaign, and they did not look like league contenders at all. But somehow, Bertie Mee, the physiotherapist, on 1971 got Arsenal to become only the second club of the 20th Classic. century to win the awesome. FA Cup and League double, being the club's first. And this is one of the most iconic seasons in Arsenal's history, and they were definitely pushed all the way. On the last day of the season, Arsenal needed to beat or draw nil-nil with North London rivals Tottenham to win the season on goal average. If they conceded a goal drew 1-1, they were basically screwed and had to win. Arsenal took the lead in a dramatic 87th minute Ray Kennedy goal to give them a 1-0 ahead at White Hart Lane. And Spurs really desperately tried to equalise, meaning that they would not let Arsenal win the league at White Hart Lane, but Arsenal held on and won the league title for the first time in such a long time. But Arsenal knew they had another game to focus on because just five days later, Arsenal beat Liverpool 2-1 at Wembley to win the FA Cup, being 0-0 in extra time with Arsenal going 1-0 down early before Eddie Kelly's 101st minute equaliser and 10 minutes later, Charlie George scoring the iconic winner from the edge of the penalty area to win the game for Arsenal and the double. Now, the 1971 season was definitely iconic for Arsenal, but they didn't really continue from there. They still had an amazing team, but couldn't ever really get it done and kept falling short for the rest of the decade. After the double, they signed World Cup winner Alan Ball for a club record 220 grand, but only ended up finishing fifth that season and started the season really poorly. But in this year, the 1971-1972 season, Arsenal did start their first European Cup campaign, being obviously now the Champions League, and they didn't really do amazingly. They started really well, but ended up losing in the core finals to so Johan Cruyff inspired Ajax obviously total football and all that and they finished total 1972 football. losing that total football era is is one of the most inspiring for someone like me who loves tactics um and that Johan Cruyff influence man that's to me that's total football is is inspiring to me as someone who loves possession football because um and possession football just makes sense to me. Counterattacking can be exciting, but I love it when, when a team has a good total football uh, possession style offense the League Cup Finals well to Leeds, while also in 1973 becoming runners-up in the first division title. But in just a year, Arsenal looked a shell of the team that won the double, and in 1973, most of that team had been broken up, with me unable to build a new team in its place, and the club's form declined sharply, finishing 16th in 1975 and 17th in 1976, their lowest in more than 40 years, which prompted me to resign and basically give up on managing in football, which prompted Arsenal to make a managerial change in 1976, bringing in former Arsenal player Terry Neal. Now Neal's a very interesting player. He played for Arsenal for a decade between 1960 and 1970 and played 241 games for the club. But then he became a player manager at Hull City, still playing 103 games but also managing them at the same time, despite him only being at the age of 28. And this led to him managing a lot of teams at a very young age. And he actually managed Tottenham Hotspur, who Arsenal poached him off, their direct rivals in 1976, when he was still only 36, being the youngest Arsenal manager of all time. He did come from Arsenal's academy and play for Arsenal so when he rejoined Tottenham it did seem a bit of betrayal so this I guess made up for it. Now Neil hadn't had that much successful time at Tottenham he did make them better but he never got Spurs anywhere beyond mid-table. He played both sides of the, the, who had been in the game, both, both sides of the fence. Up Neil did slightly improve Arsenal at the start they moved back into the top half of the table but mostly it was inspired by the emergence of Irish superstar Liam Brady. And Brady was not the only one. This was a big part of the large Irish contingent at Highbury. I'll go ahead and say this is unrelated to what's going on in the video. Those red kits, those are iconic. Stick to the red kits, Arsenal. Those yellow ones are tacky and gross. But that red kit, and I see Arsenal in the red kit, and I, you know, I just, it seems uh, prestigious. I'll give you that. Those are iconic kits. Terry Neal is obviously Northern Irish, but Pat Rice, Frank Stempleton, Pat Jennings, Sammy Nelson, John Devon, and the young David O'Leary also were from Ireland and Northern Ireland as well. And this team did have a lot of quality, but they could not challenge the league dominance of Liverpool at the time, who dominated the 70s and 80s because they were just so good. Towards the end of the decade, they proved they definitely were a cup competition team and could cause some upset, reaching the 1978, 1979, and 1980 FA Cup finals in a row. They did only win one of these, however, against 
Manchester United, largely inspired by Brady when Arsenal went 2 0 up, but then it went 2 2 and then they scored a late goal. If you haven't seen this game, it's brilliant. I recommend watching it. And the next season didn't go that well. In the 1979 1980 season, they played 70 games, which is a record breaking high because they reached two cup finals. But they lost the FA Cup final to West Ham and lost the Cup Winners' Cup final to Valencia. And with also the poor league positions, a lot of their team decided to leave at this point. Liam Brady, the best player for the club by far, left in the summer of 1980 to go to Italian side Juventus. And through 1980 to 1986, they really did struggle. They didn't really do a lot. They came in the top four in the league quite a lot and kept getting into Europe, but didn't do a lot in Europe and didn't do a lot in the FA Cup, never looking like they were going to win it. And despite the team being a lot better than when he joined, Neil really struggled to control his team. He, throughout his tenure, he had fallen out with many of his players, meaning a lot of them had wanted to leave and didn't want to be at the club. And the team had a bad drinking culture with a lot of players getting pissed before games and not even turning up. And under his management, he really struggled to make yes, any sorry. sort of impact at the team and had embarrassing cup defeats, losing to part-timers KFC Winter Slag in the 1982 UEFA Cup and third division side Walsall again in 1984 League Cup. So he was sacked in December 1983. Powell, who was Neil's assistant, was appointed to be manager. He was also one of the coaches when Arsenal won the double in the 70s. But he really struggled to make Arsenal challenge anywhere near the title. And in 1985, they lost to third division side York City and the fans had had enough and they were not going to the games anymore with this attendance dropping below 20,000. Now the chairman at the start was Dennis Hill Wood, obviously the son of Samuel Hill Wood, who was also the chairman. He actually died in 1982 and was taken over by a third generation, Peter Hillwood, who became the chairman in 1982. However, Peter didn't really have much interest in running Arsenal as a football club and he actually sold 16% of his shares to David Dean and David Dean became the vice chairman of Arsenal and basically did all of the dealings day to day while Peter just stayed out of it. David Dean paid 292 grand for his 16% share and Hillwood actually described Dean as crazy to invest his money in the club, stating that it's all intents and purposes is dead mm. money. But nevertheless, David Dean still ran the club in the 1983 taken over. Now, because Arsenal weren't very good at the start of the 80s, they actually tried to get rid of Dan Howe without telling him. They contacted Barcelona coach Terry Venables as his replacement. Howe finally realised about this and resigned straight away. He was not having any of it. And when they looked for a summer replacement, the shortlist looked like this. Terry Venables, mm. Alex Ferguson and George Graham. Now, originally, Arsenal wanted to get Alex Ferguson Alex. in in 1986 and have Graham as his assistant, but Ferguson rejected this. And six months later, we all know where Alex Ferguson went, so... But Arsenal decided to change their yeah. plans anyway and hired we know where Alex as Ferguson. the first team manager. Now, George Graham was an Arsenal legend through and through. He played 229 league games through the end of the 60s and the 70s mm -hmm. for Arsenal and was part of that double winning team in the 1970s. George Graham was Arsenal's third choice to be manager and he didn't even put his name in the hat for the job and he was Millwall manager at the time doing a very good job so there was a lot of big teams that wanted him. But in May 1986, George Graham agreed to join Arsenal as manager and wanted to do things his way. Graham started his era at Highbury by selling off most of the older players and replacing them with new silent and younger players from the academy. Immediately, Arsenal were 100 times better and were top of the league in Christmas 1986. Young players such as Lee Dixon, Nigel Winterburn, Steve Bold, David Rocastle, Alan Smith, Tony Adams and Paul Merson were really, really good in the side. Despite Arsenal kind of choking the first season in charge, becoming fourth and leading most of the season, Arsenal pay sell stadium disaster, which happened mm, from between yeah. Liverpool and Juventus, where UEFA banned all English clubs from going in Europe. Now, this disaster was appalling, and there was 39 deaths and six... Yeah, that was, a, that was a disaster caused by, I believe it was 14 Liverpool uh, fans that were just uh, horrible behavior, and unfortunately, many people lost their life, and it was a, it was a horrible disaster. Um, and so I remember learning about this ban on English clubs, um, and so, yeah hundred non-fatal injuries where basically Liverpool fans pressed against the collapsing wall which made Juventus fans get crushed inside. This was just before the Cup Winners' Cup final in 1985. Now this is one of the darkest moments in UEFA competition history and 14 Liverpool fans were guilty of manslaughter and sentenced to six years in prison. But instead of punishing just Liverpool, all English sides were banned from Europe for yeah. six years after that. Yeah. And I'm not sure, I didn't know, I don't know too much about the history here, so I don't want to talk too much about Liverpool fans. I'm not sure that it's Liverpool fans on aggregate that are guilty of this, but it did seem like there was a significant portion of Liverpool fans that were behaving just deplorable behavior, especially those 14 that were 
were uh, sentenced, uh, criminally charged. Um, but yeah, like I, I don't want to say the Liverpool fan base and aggregate is guilty of this, but there was certainly behavior by Liverpool fans that was worthy of punishment, but instead it got extended to all English teams. This, which meant English teams struggled to get big players in in the late 80s, early 90s. But with no European football, it actually gave Arsenal a lot of ability to improve in the league and domestic competitions. And they actually made it to the League Cup final a year later, but did lose to Luton Town. Look at that, L Luton lost. Town! However, in 1989, in Graham's third season, Arsenal won their first league title since 1971 in a highly dramatic fashion. Having led the league since Christmas, Arsenal were overtaken by Liverpool after losing to Derby County and drawing at home to Wimbledon in May. Arsenal had seemingly thrown away the title, but in the final game of the season on the 26th of May was against Liverpool at Anfield. Now, in probably one of the most famous games in Arsenal's history, Arsenal needed to win by two goals to take the title. Liverpool had already won the FA Cup and were favourites to complete the double. Alan Smith scored for Arsenal early in the second half to make it 1-0, but as time ticked away, Arsenal was struggling to get a second. And it actually looked like Arsenal weren't going to get this second goal to win 2-0 to win the league. But with only seconds to go, a Smith flick on found Michael Thomas surging through the Liverpool defence and the young midfielder lifted the ball over the goalkeeper giving Arsenal the title. This is where that famous role and celebration came from. This was even more impressive because Liverpool were the dominant side in England. They pretty much kept winning the league title at this time and even won it the year after where Arsenal came fourth again and they were just so dominant in everything. George Graham was a very smart manager and actually after one year of not being that good knew that in 1991 that he could really come back and reclaim this title. So he signed big players like David Seaman and Andres Limpa in the summer of 1990 and these two players helped Arsenal retake the title back in 1991 despite Arsenal actually having two major setbacks in the season. This included getting two points deducted as they had a massive fight with 10 players involved against Manchester United at Old Trafford and captain Tony Adams being sentenced to four months in prison hey. because he drank dry just before Christmas. Despite this Arsenal yeah, was the do dominant that. team in the country that year and only lost one league match all season and finished seven points clear of Liverpool. However they did go out to Tottenham Hotspur in the FA Cup quarter final. But that didn't matter because <laughs> Arsenal had their pulling power back. And in September 1991, Arsenal paid a cup record fee of 2.5 million for. I'm just playing around, guys. I'm trying to I'm trying to give Arsenal flowers here, but you know. Talk Crystal Palace striker Ian Wright, who would eventually go on to spend seven years at the club and be one of the best players ever at Arsenal Football Club. However, it didn't go off to the best start because in the 1991-1992 season, the club really didn't have a great year. They got to the first ever European Cup for 20 years, but were knocked out badly by Benfica in the second round. And they were also knocked out of the FA Cup by lowly Wrexham, and Arsenal really didn't play that well and finished fourth wow. in the league. And fourth in the league in 1992 weren't even enough for Europe because obviously they weren't in it for five years, English side, so the coefficient got really ruined so they were only just getting back into it but football was changed completely on its head in 1992 in England with the inaugural start of the FA Premier League. Now the Premier League was made for money there's no doubt about it. It was a way to sell great footballing aspects in England rather than it being Division 1 but also English football had fallen off a bit in the 80s and they wanted to bring it back to where the big leagues are like La Liga were and Arsenal's vice chairman at the time David Dean actually had a big part in the architecture and the formation of the Premier League wanting to represent present American attraction of sport leagues and a lot of people have credited him as the real brains behind the project. With the FA Premier League being a lot more marketable and a lot more able to go to different leagues a lot of teams knew they needed to make big decisions early so Arsenal actually brought in John Jensen who just won the Euro 92 with Denmark. However this was mostly because David Rocaster went to Leeds and they just won the league so you know losing your best player is not great. However around this point George Graham actually altered his tactics to become more defensive and turned out a far attacking midfield team which deeply mainly relied on Wright to score goals rather than the whole team and they just scored around 40 goals in the 1992-1993 season with the first year of the Prem. And they came 10th which was mid-table so they still weren't really doing that well. And they actually lost their first ever Premiership game 4-2 after being 2-0 up against underdogs Norwich at Highbury and in the end Norwich were predicted to get relegated and actually ended up being in the title race and coming third. I'm actually from Norwich so uh, shout out. But despite being crap in the league they actually did really really well in the cup competitions in the first year of the Prem 
Premier League, winning both the League Cup and the FA Cup against Sheffield Wednesday in the finals. This was enough for Arsenal to qualify in Europe for the 1993-1994 season. And they actually won their Cup Winners' Cup against Palmer 1-0 in the final. And Palmer were the favourites for this because Arsenal were losing a lot of key players, such as Martin Keown and John Jensen, with Ian Wright being suspended as well. And despite George Graham struggling in the early years of the Premier League, they were very good in Cup competitions. His defensive system seemed to work against teams that needed a goal against him in the Cup, and they just seemed to nick results. So fair play there, I guess. However, George Graham's massive tenure at the club came to an end just in February after that in 1995. Now, it's a good thing to say Arsenal were struggling in the league at this point. They are pretty much a mid-table side and weren't really doing much more than that. Yet, they were doing well in the Cup competition, so you can give them that. But George Graham wasn't sacked for that reason. He was actually sacked in the February because it was discovered that he accepted an illegal 425 grand payment from Norwegian <laughs> agent Rune Hogg following Arsenal's 1992 acquisition of John Jensen, one of his clients. So it seems like the dodgy <laughs> dealings don't go away from Arsenal just yet. George Graham left halfway through the 1995 season, so there was still a few months of the season left. So assistant manager Stuart Houston basically had to take over because you couldn't really get manager jobs halfway through the season back then. Arsenal finished 12th in the Premier League, but they did reach another Cup Winners' Cup final after a Titanic semi-final win against Sampdoria, winning on penalties and drawing 5-5. Now, unfortunately for Arsenal, they played Real Zarzagona in the final and lost because of a 120th minute goal from a 40-yard strike in the last kick of the game, putting to an end another disappointing campaign. Arsenal needs yeah. a new era. Era. So in June 1995, they appointed play. Bruce Rioch as their new manager, who had just guided Bolton Wanderers to the League Cup final and promotion to the top flight. He was given money as soon as he joined, and he briefly broke Dennis the transfer Burkham. record in Dennis the wild Burkham. side of Dennis, Dennis Burkamp for 7.5 mil from Inter Milan. Obviously, we know what Dennis Burkamp went on to do, and he had an impressive partnership with Ian Wright at the start. Arsenal reached the League Cup semi-finals and finished fifth in the Premiership at the end of the 1996 season, securing a place in the UEFA Cup. Now, this is actually not a bad season. They came 12th this season before so a big improvement and overall the board were pretty happy with Bruce Riog. they thought that he had a great start a great first season and it was a great start to his era but it just straight away ended in August 1996 with him being in charge for one season this is because Riog was sacked because of dispute over transfer funds with the board of directors triggering a couple of months turmoil at the club with Stuart Houston again taking temporary charge and he was there for a month before resigning to take over at QPR then youth team coach Pat Rice came up and took a coach of a couple of games before they finally made the decision on a long-term manager and obviously that is the man that we all know Arsene Wenger joined the Arsene club in Wenger. 1996 when he was in Japan managing Yokozuna before immediately they improved under Wenger's management coming third and winning the UEFA Cup place in 1996-1997 this, this is getting to the era that I actually know a little bit about Arsenal history uh I know that we're getting really close to the invincible season in 2004 um with Thierry Henry and um Thierry Henry, um, and Patrick, oh, I know his name, starts with a V, Patrick something, um, yeah, and this just, this was a good squad, that Invincible squad, so I, I have a little bit of knowledge about uh, Arsenal at this point, um, so this is the lead up to that time with uh, Arsene Wenger just starting. And missing out on second but Wenger brought a modern day approach which was needed at Arsenal at the time and he actually brought a lot of crop of French players who were largely unknown in the UK Patrick Vieira had been signed on Wenger's recommendations before he had officially Vieira, taken up the reins and Wenger added Vieira. Nicholas Amelka and Emmanuel Petit as well as Dutch winger Mark Overmars in the summer of 1997 Wenger melded his team with these new players while with some of the old guards still staying there with Adams, Dixon, Winterburn, Keown and Bold and he kept Pat Rice as assistant manager having a bit of mix of both. Wenger had a lot to prove when he came in. He came in in the mid-90s in England and he was a French manager so a lot of people didn't understand why he had taken over England and he was the first French manager to ever take over in the Premier League. He was also relatively unknown in English football and considering Arsenal was quite an established club, a lot of people didn't know why they had signed him. <laughs> But the people at Arsenal knew they had a great appointment because just in a few weeks he completely changed the culture around the club. Unlike his predecessors, Wenger was given control over transfers and training sessions. He had a hands-on approach to every training session and was there all the time coaching his team how he wanted. He also made steps to change the drinking culture at Arsenal. And although he initially allowed players to have a pint of beer, they were forbidden to drink on days off and in the players' lounge. He later banned his players from casually wow. drinking together anyway. Wenger also promoted pasta as the pre-match dish, encouraged bull chicken instead of red meat and discouraged junk food. Players received optimal vitamin injections and creatine, which reduced 
fatigue and improve their stamina. This was not a thing before he joined. Everyone basically went and played a game and then would go up and have a piss up after. That would be the whole football uh, culture. So he really Yeah, that's, that's something so cool about Wenger is that he, he understood that there's so much more involved in success in football than just what happens on the pitch and just the tactics employed. There's so much more success. And that's that's true in all sports. Like you got to take care of your body. Like for these players, your career and your business is your body. You need to take care of it, um, especially playing a sport with this much running involved. Um, like you've got to take care of your heart. You got to take care of your body to enable to keep up with that. So, yeah, the diet is super important did change a lot of it. It did take time for people to understand his philosophy because a lot of the players of the old guard didn't really like how he'd come in and completely change things. Captain Tony Adams was very upset that he didn't let them drink as much as they did. But in his second season, he proved that his philosophy was right and Wenger got his first silver and became the first foreign manager to win the English league, in which he also steered his side to the second double of all time. This was their first Premier League title and it was also kind of mad because at Christmas they looked out of it being losing 3-1 to Blackburn and they were 12 points behind league leaders Manchester United. But Manchester United choked and Arsenal did a brilliant job to come back while also beating Newcastle 2-0 in the FA Cup final to complete the double. To top it off, that was the same season Ian Wright broke Cliff Batten's goalscoring record, bringing his tally to 185 goals for the club before he left in the summer of 1998, being the top goalscorer at the time. This proved he really was a top manager and could get the best out of his team. However, he was definitely not bulletproof. In 1998, Arsenal signed Freddie Lundberg and a year later they signed Thierry on but they had a barren period when them did join and they actually really struggled to get anywhere close to the league title. This is because they kept bottling things. They led the league in much of the 1998-99 season, but they lost 1-0 to Leeds and allowed Man United to overtake them. And they also lost to Manchester United in the semi-final of the FA Cup and failed to get out of the group stage of the Champions League. And the season after this, in the 1999-2000 season, they also finished second again. They weren't really any title race and they were 18 points behind winners Manchester United. And in this season, they came third in their Champions League group and made their go into the UEFA Cup and which they lost in the final to Galatasaray on penalties. Now, Arsenal had a really good squad but they just weren't as good as Manchester United and it seemed like Arsene Wenger just kept getting beaten by Sir Alex every time so it looked like their title double was a bit of a fluke and this continued next season because in 2001 they yet again finished second 10 points behind Manchester United right. and also lost 6-1 at Old Trafford that year they also lost the FA Cup final to Liverpool and it was because of a this controversial handball in the first half that went season. unpunished with Michael Owen scoring the Her decisive period. goals in the end by 2001 Arsenal were basically not a team they were in 1990 Wenger had been forced to rebuild much of the double winning side and Anelka over Martin Petit had all left the Spanish clubs in return for hefty fees while age was really catching up with the famous backline. Bold and Winterbrun had already left and Adam Dixon would only last another Patrick, season before yeah. retiring. This meant Arsenal needed to rebuild and in the early 2000s people became a lot more aware of European footballers and European football so a lot more players were out there for Arsenal to get and Arsenal decided to sign Sol Campbell and Laurent in defence as well as promoting Ashley Cole from their youth ranks and at this oh. point Oh, Arsenal had so Campbell is the one they they signed him from Tottenham, right? That was like a a massive uh, scandal. And I know as a Spurs fan, I am not supposed to be a fan of that man. Basically, had a top striker in Thierry Henry, as he's been converted from the wing since he signed and scored 17 Premier League goals in his first two seasons in England. But Arsenal knew they needed attacking help to give him any chance of winning the league, so they brought in Robert Perez and Sylvan Wiltor in attack in 2001. And attack is definitely what Arsenal were good at. They won a record equal in third double in 2001 2002. The Gunners were the only team to score in every game of the Premiership season and went unbeaten in domestic away games. They had finally defeated Sir Alex Ferguson and the Manchester United once again. With it being in a tight race at the start with three points separating the top four in February, but Arsenal pulled away from the pack with a 13 game winning streak, finishing seven points ahead of runners up Liverpool. Arsenal secured the title in a penultimate match of the season with a 1-0 win at, against Manchester United at Old Trafford with a goal coming from Sylvan Wilter, the new signing. This actually solidified the double as the previous weekend they had wrapped up their eighth FA Cup winning 2-0 against Chelsea by two astounding goals by Ray Palmer and Freddie Lundberg. And with Arsenal's superstar team, they tried to 
take this into the 2003 season and Arsenal became the first club in more than 20 years to retain the FA Cup winning one then against Southampton thanks to a Pires goal. However, their joy wasn't that great because they still missed out on the Premier League title to Manchester United again, coming second behind them for yet another time. However, with what happened the next season, I'm sure they don't care. As I'm sure you all know, the 2003-2004 Premier League season for Arsenal was one of the best seasons ever and I don't know if it's ever going to be captured again. I'm sure you know by now, but Arsenal won the Premiership title again, being unbeaten the whole season with 26 wins, 12 draws and 0 losses, finishing 11 points clear of second place Chelsea. Having been the and also that period was more than just a, a period of, what, 38 games unbeaten? Yeah, I think the, the streak actually extended to 49 or something like that because they, they went on another unbeaten streak uh, as the next season began. See? I know my Arsenal history just a little bit. The second team to ever go unbeaten in the top flight in English football with Preston North End in 1889. Although they did lose in the FA Cup and Champions League and League Cup, they were so good in the league, they were so clear of everyone else. And I know 12 draws is a lot of draws. They didn't lose a game, which is crazy. Even the best teams now don't do that. This season was commended with a golden trophy at the end of it. And eventually Arsenal still have that golden trophy now. This will mean that team will always be remembered and Arsene Wenger will always go down in Premier League history. I mean, he did win three of them, but he also got a golden one as well. And the European football that Arsenal had at this time was very big. They didn't have that many English players in the team and it's very much an international scene with Wenger in charge. Players such as Patrick Vieira, Thierry Henry, Robert Pires, Dennis Bergkamp, Silva, Laurent, Freddie Lundberg and Jens Lehmann all became legends of the team. And although Arsenal were not able to recapture this next season or ever after this, this will definitely go down as one of the best things ever at the club. Despite being a very strong side at the time Arsenal were in a Premier League which is very competitive Chelsea just got given money and were signing who yeah. they wanted and were very competitive and Manchester United was still really good so they were unable to retain the title in 2000 if I remember correctly they go on a season a period where they haven't really won much ever since uh, except for you know they, they've been competing for it the last few years for 2005 and they finished second 12 points behind that record breaking Chelsea side but the Gunners did stretch their unbeaten run to 49 consecutive matches in the Premier League which is still not being beaten to this day however when they did lose to Manchester United they really struggled to gain any sort of form for the rest of the season and eventually did well to come second but didn't do anything in much of the competitions other than winning the FA Cup for the third time in four years winning 5-4 on penalties against Manchester United where they got dominated the whole 90 and just played for pens and won on pens little did they know that was the last trophy they would win for a while. After his FA Cup winning penalty, Patrick Vieira actually joined Juve in the summer of 2005, leaving Arsenal and severely weakening this midfield. Domestically, they weren't anywhere near any trophies, but they did just clutch up so they got Champions ah. League football and came fourth with the last three games of the season. This could be down to the team not being as strong anymore, but also the domestic form really struggled because they tried in the Champions League and they actually reached their first ever Champions League final this season. And in the knockout rounds, they actually played Real Madrid, Juventus and Villarreal and did didn't concede in 10 matches in the competition and then played final against Barcelona. Now for most Arsenal fans this is not really something you want to remember so I'll be quick about it. Arsenal got an early red card with Jens Lehmann the goalkeeper doing a professional foul on Barcelona. Nevertheless they were the ones that scored first. Sol Campbell scored a header with, from a free kick in the 37th minute. Arsenal desperately defended the lead but the two late goals from Eto and Belletti meant Barcelona ran out 2-1 winners because Almunia was in goal and he can't defend his near post. In the end Arsenal lost but they played well in the whole tournament. However things were going to look up for Arsenal because in 2006 they actually did a big decision and moved to their new stadium the Emirates Stadium. Now they did this because at this point everyone knew who Arsenal were. Football was massive in the UK. So Arsenal were one of the biggest teams and they were very successful in the late 1990s and early 2000s. Ibrey's capacity was limited at 38,000 and they wanted to make more money so they basically moved to the Emirates which is a 60k thousand stadium. They started construction in December 2002 and it was ready in July 2006 for the new 2006-2007 season. And Arsenal took a little time to get used to their new surroundings and as as early as November, manager Arsene Wenger conceded that his side were unlikely to make a serious challenge for the title. But with their new fancy stadium as well, they really struggled to keep their mm. players because they needed the money to fund for the stadium. Most of the invincible side had been moved on at this point. Robert Pires, Dennis Burkham, Laurent, Ashley Cole and Sol Campbell all left in 2006. And a year later, and their club captain all-time record goalscorer Thierry Henry departed for Barcelona. This meant Arsene Wenger had to rebuild the team and youngsters like Cesc Fabregas, Adi Bayor and Theo Walcott would all been drafted into the side to play a lot that season. And and 
young team made a strong bid for the title in 2007-2008, completing a club record unbeaten run of 28 games and leading the league until February, when an injury to striker Eduardo proved a turning point as the Gunners finished third. And the next few years were kind of similar for Arsenal. They had good title charges in 2010 and 2011, but then fell short after the second half of the season because they just struggled with injuries and struggled with a consistent amount of playing. And they did win a trophy in this time and actually lost in the League Cup final into Birmingham in 2011 after a mistake by Koscielny in defence. They did have good players in this time but didn't have a great squad and a lot of their big players left in different years. Fabregas left to Barcelona in 2011, Nasri went to Man City in 2011 and Ravel Van Persie went to Man United in 2012, all going to big rivals. And they didn't really replace them because they didn't Arteta have was a player? the capabilities of the teams around them. However, the size ah. did drop below fourth in the table. I didn't know Arteta played for them. Consistently getting into the like Champions him. League, yet they weren't really doing much in it and lost in the last 16 stage at seven years in a row between 2011 and 2017. They were capable of ex excellent performances but just could not be consistent enough. Despite not being very successful in the league or in the Champions League, Arsenal's nine-year trophy drought came to an end in 2014 as they won the FA Cup for the fifth time under Arsene Wenger. At this point, this was seen as a new era for Arsenal as Arsenal had just signed superstar Meza Ozil from Real Madrid in summer 2013 for a record-breaking £40 million. However, it didn't really work like that but they were very good in the FA Cup, also winning it in 2016 and in 2017, making Wenger the record seventh time FA Cup winner. However, 2017 was seen as an end of an era as it was the first time they hadn't got into the Champions League places in 19 years and came fifth in the league having to play in the Europa League next year. And in 2017-2018 it was the last season Wenger was in charge and they reached the Europa League semi-final in which they crashed out and also the League Cup final which they got destroyed by Man City. In the off-season they lost Theo Walcott, Giroud, Sanchez in January and twice broke the club's transfer record with Lacazette and Aubameyang coming in just before he left. But to most Arsenal fans the damage was done, Wenger had to go this summer because he just wasn't good enough anymore. They hadn't done much in the league in 15 years at this point and he had struggled to really sign players and didn't seem like he wanted to put his money in his hand in his pocket, giving him too much control on transfers. Such a disappointing yeah, end to a time for such a legend at Arsenal's football club. After 22 years, Arsene Wenger was the longest serving and most successful manager at the club, so he definitely made a big impact on English football at Arsenal. A month afterwards, the club announced that former PSG manager Unai Emery would be taken ahead of the new head coach role instead of manager. This meant Arsenal were going to go for more of the director of football approach to buy players that he wanted, but not giving the manager free reign because Wenger didn't put his money in his pocket too much. Unai Emery's time at Arsenal was definitely short-lived. He definitely had a lot of work to do when he had just taken over as someone who's 22 years, but he had a 22-game unbeaten run as his start as well, but the performances weren't very good and Arsenal seemed like they were getting very lucky. But there was a lot of rebuilding for Arsenal to do, so they give him a season. I don't know, Emery's brilliant nice, record in the Europa League nice and in Europe, team. people expected them to do really well in the Europa League and Arsenal did reach the final, their first Europe final in 13 years, but got absolutely destroyed by Chelsea 4-1 in Baku. This and the fact that they had focused on the Europa League over the league coming fifth, not getting Champions League football, meant a lot of fans were very angry with Unai Emery, but they gave him another season to be the head coach. But after going winless in nine games between October and November the next season, he was dismissed being a big sacking for Arsenal who don't do many decisions like that. And this created a lot of turmoil for the club generally. They wanted a lot more done. They wanted the backstage team to be accountable and they wanted the owners to be gone. Because in April 2007, some of the shares of the stake were sold to a company called Cronkay KSE. Now Cronkay KSE is read by Stan Cronkay, American businessman and billionaire. And eventually he kept buying more and more stake in Arsenal as it was definitely profitable. Cronkay did not know much about British sport and had bought a lot of different American teams and he didn't seem to really care. He sort of let Arsene Wenger do everything he wanted when he was there but now with Arsenal having a new culture they needed to get new managers in and needed a new fresh start. Cronkay was hated by the fans as they felt like he didn't care about the club and didn't give them enough money to make it better and loads of Arsenal fans started boycotting games around the Unai Emery era until he finally got Cronkay gone. However the Cronkays came out and said they would not sell and Josh Cronkay stand and son actually was put in director in charge for 10 years but was finally getting shown to the public. He became a spokesperson for Arsenal and helped them through this time. And after a three-week caretaker stint from assistant manager and former invincible Freddie Lundberg, Arsenal hired former club captain Mikel Arteta as head coach, with Arteta having been previously worked as assistant to Pep Guardiola at Manchester City. Although there was a lot of work for the Arsenal team to do, a lot of fans were very happy about the fact that they got a young new manager in, a bit like when they got Arsene Wenger in. And they got someone who was recently a club captain that, so people that, like that tells you that tells you how new i am to this to this game the fact that he was recently a captain for arsenal and i i don't know i just knew he, i i've only known him as the manager of arsenal so that's that's wow
kept him. However, just three months into Arteta's reign, the season was suspended due to the pandemic. After the season resumptions 100 days later, all matches were played behind closed doors, which is a lot different as there was no fans to cheer on the team. Arsenal secured a disappointing eighth in the league, but made up with it with a record extending 14th FA Cup win, which came just 28 games into Arteta's reign with Aubameyang scoring a brace against Chelsea in the final. This proved there was something to Arteta, even if the league performances weren't there. And the season after that, Arteta did domestically struggle again, coming eighth for the second season in a row, and they were eliminated in the semi-finals of the Europa League, meaning they would not compete in any European competition for the first time since 1996. This led to a lot of fans wanting Arteta to be sacked, but the team was at a really bad state as Arsenal had not really done joined up thinking for many years at this point. But Arteta, and with the hire of Edu as technical director, said that it would take time with their money and their players that they're going to bring in over a year period. Despite the board still getting a lot of criticism as Arsenal signings hadn't really done very well and Arsenal was still 8th place, a lot of people still wanted the Cronkays gone and it didn't help when the European Super League was announced in the start of 2021. And the club was one of the 12 founder members of the Breakaway Super League but was one of the first to withdraw. Uh, when they got that is such a class. Oh man, that's such a good photo. Football is not a TV show. I literally just did a video about how uh, that's that's what American sports are. It's it's a uh, sports TV show <laughs> production, sports production. Hey, I like sports productions, but I, I get the I get the point here heavy public backlash saying they only were in it because they felt like they had to be. This angered the footballer world even more because Arsenal didn't even qualify for Europe that year so to think that they deserved to be in it on merit is not really a good enough and Arsenal knew they really needed the Mikel Arteta project to get good quick. But they definitely went to a slow start because in the 2021-2022 season Arsenal found themselves bottom of the league at the end of August wow. after they lost the first three games of the season. Although they did have to play a very Covid filled team against Brentford and then did also lose to Chelsea the European champions and Man City the Premier League champions but Arsenal did recover in the season and challenged for the top four spots in May they held pole position over local rivals Tottenham but eventually finished fifth losing 3-0 at Tottenham with a few games left however an eighth to fifth showed real improvement and Arsenal and Arteta had a plan and Kronke seriously backed Arteta in that season they brought in Jesus for 52 million Fabio Vieira for 35 Sinchenko for 35 and other players Kaviar came in for 25 in January and so did Trossard and Georgi for 24 and 11 and before the 2022-23 season Arsenal were expected to struggle to get top four but they easily got it this season being brilliant and winning all their games in August a complete reverse from the previous year however despite occupying top spot for majority of the season only four wins in the final two months of the season meant they finished runners up to Manchester City but they did break in the record for the most days spent at the top of the league without winning however that leads to this season where Arsenal have brought even more players in like Declan Rice for 100 mil breaking their chance of record but the team is definitely in a much better place with exciting youngsters such as Sacra. I just say it now. This is the team that I know, uh, obviously, because it's now. But if I have to cut any of this out, it's due to copyright. Like he's showing a lot of game footage now. I think that this video has edited the game footage in such a way that it might it might pass a copyright check. But if any of this is clipped out, that's the reason. That's the reason that I cut it out. Not because I hate Arsenal. Just because they claim my video, they claim my ad revenue, and I don't like that. Martinelli and brilliant midfielders like Rice and Odegaard this team is real top quality and Arteta is a brilliant young manager that is the whole complete history of Arsenal where will they be next year where will they go from here is there more league titles in their history all right so as much as it pains me as a Spurs fan there is an hour of flowers for Arsenal 